Yeah, well, the, uh, the basic uh, configuration of the enterprise was something that Gene Rodberry insisted that it <clears throat> maintain the saucer, the strut and the cells, and the lower fuselage. And uh, so that was, uh, you know, when I initially got on the project, I, you know, suggested other things. And he said, no, it was essential that that was a personality of the, of the franchise. And uh, the reveal of it, you know, the whole uh, flight up with uh, Spock, I mean, with um, Kirk. Kirk to see and reveal the, you know, rebuilt Enterprise was an essential part of the film and something that uh, uh, he had a lot of input into as far as the design. The next slide, please. Wait, you, but before you do that, this was the configuration uh, that you guys did at Astra. That's and right. This was before that they put on the uh, external uh, lighting gear. Yeah. Right, on the saucer there was an added, <clears throat> a couple add-ons there. A lot of the functions of the Enterprise were designed around what happened in the script, you know, the, uh, the uh, shuttlecraft bringing them up and the docking, and then, of course, the Vulcan shuttle uh, arriving and Spock uh, coming aboard at the bridge. Go to the next slide, please, Robert. So storyboarding the, uh, the film, we at, at Astra Image or Able and Associates um, boarded it uh, three times from beginning to end, and it's a very complicated, uh, image to draw. Ed Vero drew these. Ed Vero is now a very fine production designer. He did all the storyboards for the Raiders films and uh, was production designer on Contact and many other films now. Uh, he uh, drew the Enterprise from so many angles he could pretty much draw it to sleep, but it's an incredibly complex object to draw from uh, different angles. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is part of the wormhole effect sequence here. Um, um, the uh, effects for the movie were changing continually as the script changed, and uh, you know this was the first uh, film that uh, Jeff Katzenberg actually was a producer on, and the whole studio was kind of learning the new uh, uh, breed of special effects that were evolving, motion control, and all of that type of stuff was not actually had not actually been used by most of the people who were originally creating the film, so we were kind of educating them and. Uh, you know, educating as we went along, and the design of the bridge and all the internal parts of the Enterprise had to match up with the exterior for the exit when they reached Viger uh, and all the other kind of story points we had to cross here. Now this shows the use of the deflector shields actually in the film, uh, and uh, we never actually got to see that until the Next Generation TV show. Yeah, they. Trumbull, uh, who took over a good portion of the effects after uh, Robert Abel and Associates left the show, uh, tried to do this. Uh, Dykstra's group, Apogee, tried to do this, and no one really managed to do it. So, all throughout the original TV series and, and throughout the movies, it was just, you know, deflected shields on, and they were this, you know, magical it, thing. Magical thing, song. yeah. Go to the next slide, please, Robert. Uh, this is the Enterprise under construction at uh, Magi, uh, and uh, I'm sorry, Magic Camp. Magic Camp, and um, we started building this thing from um, um, blueprints that we had uh, drawn, and it uh, is a very big model. It's eight feet long, and it had at least 25 lighting systems in it because under motion control, you make like separate this. passes uh, for each of the lighting systems uh, to control the exposure. Uh, so the model was very heavy, it was designed to be armatured from six different uh, sides, from the front, the rear, left, right, bottom, and top, uh, depending on the shots. And then of course the armature is matted out. Go to the next slide, please. There you go. There's another shot. It was kind of an up angle of the thing. And one of the, the things that uh, I got into was we had to build a, a massive amount of detail into the surface. The paint job on the Enterprise actually took uh, you know a month or more to do. Uh, painting all those different textures on the saucer to create a sense of platelets. But uh, because the Enterprise is a relatively kind of smooth craft, that's the only way we could build scale into it. Unlike a lot of models, like the Klingons, for example, have a lot of what we call greebies or textures and stuff built on them. The Enterprise is a very smooth and streamlined surface. Tell her. Uh, Where's tell that her. Model today? What's that? Where's that model today? Well, the original model went on up to. Uh, uh, Paul ILM. Allen's, yeah. Well, Paul Allen's garage is the. Is that yeah, where I, 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 it was? I, it was auctioned by Paramount uh, a couple of years ago. 
and no one actually knows for sure who the actual purchaser was. Well, it also uh, was used uh, in the next picture, and in the next picture, parts of it were destroyed, so it got pretty beat up. And where the actual real original is versus uh, pieces and parts that were built for the second film, I'm not sure. Right. Tell them, tell them about the, the design inspiration for that little part there. Uh, well, the nacelles were uh, one of the things I spent a lot of time designing. Uh, I wanted to create, I tried to kind of give the Enterprise a kind of art deco kind of quality to it, a lot of parallel lines, and uh, you know, we put the uh, we put the ion engine at the back of the saucer so the whole saucer could eject and fly by itself. Uh, it had its own landing gear and uh, so forth, so there was a lot of function thought about, but I basically designed the front of that uh, nacelle from a 1944 uh, grill. <laughs> Next slide, please. Uh, here's a, a scale reference here, the size of the uh, people, you know, uh, when they went to, to the, when they came out to go to Viger. Uh, if you look on the very right there, that uh, lozenge shaped window, the windows of the Enterprise were all, uh, there's a huge light ring inside, and uh, there are transparencies inside all those windows. Those are actually quarter inch plexiglass that's polished, and so they're illuminated from the inside, so if the camera came very close, you could actually see architecture in there that we shot of stills. But there's also pictures of us and Mickey Mouse and all kinds of things looking at it. Now, is Kirk holding Spock's hand? Is that Spock and McCoy? Yes. Okay. Next slide. This is actually kind of cool. Uh, in my intro, I said that there was no CG. And there wasn't, not at least in the form that we know it today that has become ubiquitous. But Robert Abel was trying to design a system. Motion control was very cumbersome to work with, and the guys who worked on Star Wars discovered that the hard way, even though they were inventing it uh, as they were going. And it's a matter of moving this massive camera that weighs probably about 200 pounds down this track and then controlling uh, with these little set of potentiometers all the little moves that the camera has to do that can then be recorded to tape or some type of digital format, and then the camera will repeat those moves. Robert Abel decided to try and take it a different way by mapping out the model using you know, computer graphics, vector graphics, graphics uh, and mapping out the field of view of lenses. They theorized that they could program out the moves with a given lens on the computer and then use that information to feed it into the motion control system. Uh, next slide. Which is this big thing. And thus they could uh, essentially pre to use a word that's used a lot today, the shots in the computer and have an idea of what they're going to look like on film. It was extremely advanced for the time and in a way it was probably a little too advanced uh, because there were a lot of kinks that need to be worked out. But that principle, which was developed in 1978 for this show, uh, we used a couple of years ago on Land of the Lost when we had to program in uh, a move on a, on a, you know, a mechanical bull-like rig and have it match up with the CG dinosaur. So it was very advanced. But you can see, this is what, you know, that's the camera. This is all the junk that had to move the camera. You know, and, and, and if this thing got going, uh, and that model got in the way, and it was in the wrong position, uh, guess which is going to win?